Our first reading this morning is the Gospel according to John, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a, brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and they could stand before all of them. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone, stone such woman. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they now? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Our reading from Matthew is the Christmas story, or at least a, a good chunk of it. The beginning of the Christmas story is this long list of begats of this person, the father, this person, the father, this person, the father, this person. And I don't want to read all of them, but I just want to give you a little bit of the flavor of that. So we're going to start with verse 12, the last 14 generations before Joseph. Then after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord to the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife. This is the word. So the book of Matthew begins with this long genealogy. I want to remind you that I did not read near the whole thing. There's 42 generations of begats. Abraham begat Isaac, begat Jacob, begat Joseph, who begat Judah, who begat Zerah and Perez by Tamar, and on and on and on, all the way until you get to Joseph, the father of Jesus. Moses wants us to know the whole genealogy of Jesus, not just that Jesus is the, the son of David, right, but that Jesus is a son of Abraham, all the way back to that moment when, when Jesus, or when Abraham was called out of her. And you know what? It's a little bit weird. Because two verses later, 
Matthew tells us that this whole genealogy thing is pretty much completely irrelevant. Joseph is not the father of Jesus. In fact, if, if you look at this you know, from a practical, evidentiary uh, perspective, Joseph, this genealogy, this list of names, is the only list of names that we can be sure does not apply to Jesus. It's the only one. But for some reason, Matthew thinks it's really important for us to hear all of these names and know all of these people who came before Joseph. And the reason for that is grace begets grace. Let me tell you what I mean. And to do that, I want to jump into John 8, the stoning of the adulterous woman. That is, I admit, not the most Christmassy of messages. But we'll get there. I, I don't quite remember what sparked this, but I, I was thinking about this passage, and, and I, I just had a, a weird question about it. How is it that somebody can be tried for adultery alone? It, it does, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? How, how is it that somebody can be, can be brought for adultery alone? Where, where is her partner in crime? The story doesn't really make sense. <coughs> um, unless, unless there's some other kind of evidence for the adultery. They said she was caught in the act of adultery, but what, what if she was caught in the act of having committed adultery? What if there was some other evidence, the kind of evidence that doesn't start to show right away? Anybody can bear witness that a woman is pregnant and unmarried. Anybody would know. Now, it, it sounds like a, a horrific thing to bring somebody who is pregnant up for execution, but we should take the law out of our own eyes first. This year, a woman was arrested and charged with manslaughter for being shot in the belly because she lost a baby. Our system is just as cruel, just as cruel. The truth is, from the beginning of time all the way to today, it has always been true that the most vulnerable people bear the brunt of the system's cruelty. Women, women, minorities, LGBTQ folks often are treated more harshly, more violently, more cruelly by the powerful. It's just a reality for us. Her story isn't sadder than stories that happen in our own backyard. So she's brought out to be stoned for adultery while Jesus is teaching the temple. And the authorities, the leaders, they ask what Jesus thinks. This is a, a with us or against us question. This is an invitation and a challenge. It's, it's, a, it's a great move because Jesus has been drawing these crowds. He's become famous for being a holy person. Everybody wants to know Jesus. Everybody wants to know what Jesus thinks. And so if he agrees with them, if he says, yeah, go ahead, Boom, Jesus agrees with us. They get that bump in their polling numbers, right? They get associated with this, with this holy person. But if Jesus stands against them, if he says no, they've got the law on their side. They can say, look at this man. He claims to be holy, but he ignores the law of Moses. They, they can score some points. It's, it's a, it's a catch-22, right? It's designed to be a catch-22. We all know situations like this, right? People say mean things in front of us and then they look at you. Like, are, are you going to say something against me or are you going to say something with me? And in those questions, there's an unstated choice, right? It's, it's you can join in, you can be a part of it, or, or you can resist it, but maybe you'll be next. What do you say? in those situations. What do you say? What do you say is what they ask Jesus. They say, the law says this. What do you say? 
And Jesus doesn't answer right away. He starts to rock in the dust. I wonder, what's he think of that? In that moment. Is he, is he thinking about another woman who is in the same situation? Is he thinking about his mom? Jesus knows this story because it's his story. Joseph made the same decision. When Mary was found unmarried and pregnant, Joseph had the choice. He could reject her publicly. And maybe she'd be in the temple with a crowd and stones just like this. He didn't. He decided he was going to do this quietly, mercifully. He said he would dismiss her quietly and then went to bed. And you know, all our plans change when God gets involved. And this time, God gets involved. Joseph has a dream, and in the dream, an angel comes to him and says, Do not be afraid. They always say that, don't they? <laughs> the child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. This child is God's child. He should be named Jesus, which means he saves, because he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke up, he made up his mind again. He decided to marry her and claim the child as his own. I think it's really easy for us to miss how brave a choice this is. How bold a choice this is. We are here, we know the end of this story. And we're all here because we believe that, that Jesus Christ was God's son. All Joseph had was some crazy dream to go on. Last week, I dreamed that there wasn't anybody in church who knew how to turn the lights on. <laughs> and so we had to have church in the dark on a Sunday morning. Dreams are not that reliable. <laughs> how do you sort out the, the God dreams from the not God dreams? How do you know something's real? All Joseph knew was that she was pregnant and he didn't do it. <laughs> but Joseph made the choice to offer grace. He wouldn't let her pay the price. If this was her mistake, then it would be his mistake too. Grace, <coughs> grace is love that is given to us without earning it, without deserving it, without anything that we do, grace is a gift of love. Mary was pregnant and unmarried. Soon enough, anyone could bear witness to what happened. Grace is the only way to describe Joseph's actions. God had a hand in it. God always does when grace is in But Jesus was born out of Joseph's grace. Joseph chose love instead of punishment. Without it, Mary might have been standing before a crowd with stones in their hands. Without Joseph, Jesus might never have been born. Joseph begat Jesus with an act of grace. Jesus is a child of grace. And 30 years later, that child of grace is standing in a temple. And on one side of him, there is a crowd of people with stones. On the, on the other side of him, there is a woman. And Jesus responds like somebody who knows that we all depend on grace. Anyone who is without sin cast the first stone. We might put it another way. If you never want to be forgiven, refuse to forgive. If you ever want to receive mercy, show mercy to others. And one by one, the stones fall to the ground. And they walk away. 
And finally, it's just Jesus and the woman, and he says, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. At least for one moment, everybody understands that we all need grace. The grace that Joseph allowed Mary and Jesus to live. The grace of Jesus allowed this woman to live. Who knows how her grace might have touched the world. And Christ's grace offers us hope too. Grace begets grace. When you make the choice to show grace to somebody, it sets off a, a, a chain reaction. It sets off a, a ripple effect because that person can then show grace to the people that they encounter. The people that they encounter can show grace to the next one. It, it, it begins when somebody chooses love instead of repentance. Somebody, Joseph, or Jesus, or you, or me, and it ripples out, and it goes further and further and further. Grace begets grace. Jesus, Matthew, wants us to know this genealogy because Joseph passed on something crucial to Jesus. Because Joseph begat Jesus, only it wasn't blood that Joseph passed on. It was grace. It was the choice over and over and over again in the history of God's people to choose love and mercy over self-righteousness and punishment. That choice made Christ possible. Mercy begets mercy. Love begets love. Grace begets grace. When you show grace, you allow something new to be born. Just like when Joseph offered grace, he enabled Jesus to be born. And your act of grace extends into that person's life, and their acts of grace ripple out from them. To forgive somebody is to give somebody a chance to make things right. To show mercy to somebody is to allow somebody to have a new life, a new hope, a new self. Every act of grace ripples out into new acts of love and forgiveness and hope and ever widening things. Grace begets grace. The choices that you make set up the future. The choice to show grace to your friends, to the people at work, to the people in your family. It ripples out way further than we can really imagine. Grace begets grace begets grace. Who knows what you might be setting off when you make the choice to love somebody instead of punishing. When you make the choice to offer forgiveness when you make the choice to offer mercy, kindness, and peace, who knows what you might be saying? This Christmas, I want you to remember Joseph. Remember that his act of grace made everything possible. This act of grace brought forth Jesus, and Jesus' acts of grace show us how to live in a world, and ultimately Jesus' act of grace on the cross is something that we all depend on. And when you go out into the world this week, today, tomorrow, the next day, and for the rest of your lives, I want you to offer grace. Because grace begets grace. And watch that grace grow and grow and grow. Be like Joseph. Bring grace into the world. Because you never know exactly what is being done. In the name of the Father and of the Son.